This is Guns and Butter. At this point, when you look at some of the uh, the oligarchs themselves, I don't think money is necessarily the driving factor behind this. I think that we have to start to understand that this is ultimately about control, a control of society, control of the very genetic uh, code of the, the planet itself. And that might sound outlandish until you start to piece all of these different pieces of the puzzle together. Control over education, control over medicine, control over plants and uh, agriculture start to form a control grid which really does look like a monopolization of almost every aspect of life as we know it. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. Today on Guns and Butter, James Corbett. Today's show, Oil and 9-11, Crossroads of Corruption and Criminality. James Corbett is the producer and host of The Corbett Report, an internet-based, independent, listener-supported alternative news source that has attracted a large audience. The Corbett Report is edited, webmastered, written, produced, and hosted by James Corbett. It includes a weekly podcast and several regular online video series. James Corbett has been living and working in Japan since 2004. He started the Corbett Report website in 2007 as an outlet for independent critical analysis of politics, society, history, and economics. Today we discuss in detail two hour-long video documentaries written and produced by James Corbett, How Big Oil Conquered the World and 9-11 Trillions Follow the Money. James Corbett, welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Well, it's nice to meet you finally, James. I'd like to talk to you today about your two video documentaries, How Big Oil Conquered the World and 9-11 Trillions Follow the Money. Your recent documentary, How Big Oil Conquered the World, was also called Rise of the Oligarchy. You produced it in four parts, The Birth of the Oligarchy, Competition is a Sin, the world in their image, and monopolizing life. You cover a breathtaking amount of complex historical events in the space of an hour and 15 minutes. And, of course, the documentary raises as many questions as it answers. Naturally, you start with the Rockefellers and move forward from there. What's an oligarchy, and why did you name it this? I think oligarchy is the best way to try to encapsulate what really developed with the creation of the oil industry as we know it. And that, of course, dates back to the 19th century and parts of the early 20th century. But it didn't take very long for the oil industry to become monopolized. Uh, It became not just a commodity that was handled by monopoly cartels, perhaps best exemplified by the standard oil cartel, but that it became the backbone for the economy and for really the entire production of world goods uh, altogether, not only in terms of the uh, energy that's required to produce and ship goods around the world, but even the goods themselves are often made out of uh, petrochemical and, uh, and basically their derivative products. So I thought it was important to try to try to understand that and and the importance of that, that the modern oligarchy as it exists over the the global economic system is in many ways an oligarchy. It is founded and run by the same family cartels that managed to monopolize the uh, the oil industry in its early parts. But I also wanted to make the point that it isn't really just the oil industry itself that is the range of influence or activity of these oligarchical interests that over the course of the 20th century, they started to branch out into a lot of very diverse fields and used the the economic control that came with the, the monopolization of the oil industry for other ends. In part two, Competition is a sin. You cover a dizzying array of subjects from ethanol, prohibition, the destruction of mass transit, the rise of OPEC, the elimination of the gold standard, petrodollars, etc. With regard to the so-called oil embargo of 1973, you talk about the Yom Kippur War as being orchestrated to ultimately usher in higher oil prices. 
I remember the 1973 oil shock, and I also remember seeing the Shah of Iran on 60 Minutes, I think it was, saying that oil tankers were leaving Iran as usual. Uh, There were also claims that these tankers were simply not being unloaded. The whole thing was fake, don't you think? Well, yes, and I think it's important to understand where the fakeness of that event really stems from. And in the documentary, I present some of the uh, documents that have since come come to light of the 1973 meeting of the Bilderberg Group, a very elite organization that has uh, largely remained under the, the media radar for, for many decades. It was founded in 1954 by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who himself, of course, is uh, reputed to be one of the major stakeholders in Shell Oil, uh, Royal Dutch Shell, that should be. And so uh, in 1973, this uh, Bilderberg meeting specifically was talking about the possibility of an oil crisis, a a large increase in energy costs that they were talking about could be as much as a $10 to $12 increase uh, in the price per barrel, which at that time was a 400% increase over regular prices. Now, it's interesting to note when this meeting convened in May of 1973, there was no oil embargo at that time. There was not even really the the hint of one because the Yom Kippur War had not even taken place at that point. This was all theoretical that they were supposedly discussing in these uh, in these leaked documents. But Lo and behold, in October of that year, of course, OPEC did decide to raise oil prices, first by 70%, and then in December, uh, the Shah of Iran, as you mentioned, demanded a 400% oil uh, price increase at the December uh, meeting of OPEC, and that was granted. So by the end of the year, uh, the Bilderberg meeting uh, that in May, uh, again, had been calling for a 400% price increase, saw that 400% price increase materialize. And I think most interestingly, uh, the uh, Saudi King Faisal's personal emissary had been asked at one point uh, by a journalist why the 400% increase was necessary and had been told uh, by the Shah Tell your king if he wants the answer to this question, he should go to Washington and ask Henry Kissinger, which is extremely interesting in light of recently declassified documents from the Israeli uh, archives that were declassified in 2013 and reported on by the LA Times and other outlets at that time that Henry Kissinger had had a back-channel negotiation, a a secret back-channel negotiation ongoing with Golda Meir in the run-up to uh, the, the Yom Kippur War in which uh, Meir and Kissinger, uh, by association, had rejected uh, numerous uh, different peace offerings by Sadat. And basically, the the war had been, if not necessarily the invasion orders signed by Henry Kissinger, at any rate, he had been complicit in in the, uh, the the push towards that war. So so that, of course, the war t- takes place and then OPEC, the OPEC embargo takes place as a result of that. So it does seem that, that we do have good, solid documentary evidence that this uh, war was engineered, at the very least allowed to happen or, or pushed into a position where it would happen so that the OPEC oil price increase would happen. And again, we have the Saudi king's personal emissary saying that Kissinger was really responsible for the uh, the Iranian demand for the oil price increase. Well, yeah, James, it it sounds like everybody was in on it, including yes. OPEC. Uh, well, exactly. Well, certain members of OPEC anyway. And of course, it did work out extremely well for certain members of the oil cartel in various parts of the world, including Saudi Arabia, who as the other the other shoe of uh, to, to drop in this uh, this changeover that took place in that period of time. Uh, became a beneficiary of the American military umbrella uh, as part of the petrodollar system that was also engineered uh, with the help of, of course, Henry Kissinger, who basically provided uh, military protection as well as uh, arms sales to Saudi Arabia in return for the Saudis agreeing to price all of their future oil sales in U.S. dollars, thus creating a demand for U.S. dollars in an environment where there was not necessarily anything really at all backing up the U.S. dollar anymore since Kissinger had taken the dollar off of the gold standard in 1971. So uh, if the Saudis and others who would obviously follow them in this move price their oil in U.S. dollars, that would create that ready-made demand. And of course, also the Saudis agreed to funnel that money back into the U.S. through the Wall Street banks by buying up U.S. treasuries. So it was a... 
a really masterful political and economic move uh, that helped to not only consolidate uh, the control of really the oligarchs, because of course this is oil interests that, that are now backing up the US dollar and thus the world monetary system as a whole, but also of course for, uh, for the very few uh, elite connected individuals and parties that, that get to, uh, to take advantage of that, uh, that new paradigm. Well, yes, exactly. And all of these things, uh, the going off the gold standard, the creation of the petrodollars, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this all uh, served to preserve the dollar as the global reserve currency, right? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, because I, I remember from your documentary, and of course, well, it's well known, that around the time that Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, there was an economic crisis that caused that, Right. Well, there was a number of, of reasons for it, and I think it was pretty inevitable by the point that uh, Nixon actually formally took the dollar off the gold standard in 1971. It was almost inevitable that that was going to happen. There were a number of reasons for it, but really throughout the 1960s, the uh, the Bretton Woods system that had been put in place uh, in the wake of World War II. Bretton Woods uh, Conference took place, of course, in New Hampshire in 1944 to form the basis of the post-World War II economy. And uh, at that point, it was agreed that basically the, the, the currencies of many different countries would be pegged to the U.S. dollar, which itself would be redeemable for gold at the rate of $35 an ounce. But in order to maintain that peg, there, of course, had to be a, well, a, a somewhat steady uh, and and predictable uh, increase in the supply of U.S. dollars at a, at a reasonable rate. But uh, as we can see, of course, with the, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, there was just increase in spending to a degree that was worrying a lot of people. And so you started to get countries like Germany and France starting to demand actual gold for their dollars. And the U.S. Federal Reserve was running out of gold reserves in order to actually backstop that. So in 1971, Nixon did end that system formally. And at that time, it really did create a system where you had this structure where all of these different currencies were more or less either pegged or working in concert with the U.S. dollar as the world reserve currency. But there was really nothing at all behind it at that point. So there had to be something to backstop that. And ultimately, it became the oil petrochemical industry that ended up backstopping it really at the the barrel of the U.S. Uh, military gun um, as as encapsulated in that deal with Saudi Arabia. Right. And of course, as I mentioned before, leading up to uh, this point in your documentary, you go through a lot of the early history of uh, oil monopolies, the elimination of ethanol as a fuel, uh, actually prohibition adding to the popularity of oil, uh, the destruction of mass transit. We all know about the electric cars. They were eliminated, etc., etc. Then in part three, the world in their image, you cover control of modern education, medicine, the monetary system, and the food supply. You begin with modern education. What was the Rockefeller plan for modern education, and how did it differ from traditional education? Well, traditional education uh, in the United States specifically, until the 1850s, there were no compulsory schooling laws. So uh, education tended to be done uh, locally and really in what would be seen from today's point of view as a disorganized way, but in fact led to remarkable successes in terms of having an educated and literate population. In fact, the 18, uh, I want to say the 1870, no, 1840 census found that uh, that literacy in the U.S. was upwards of 92 to 100 percent, which shouldn't be surprising because, of course, if you go back to revolutionary times, uh, common sense was a remarkably popular uh, pamphlet that really did start to turn the tide of American public opinion towards the uh, the revolutionary uh, bent that it took and and saw through to the conclusion of the creation of the country. So I think it was well known that uh, that the American populace was extremely well educated before there was compulsory schooling. I'm speaking with writer and producer James Corbett. Today's show, Oil and 9-11. Crossroads of Corruption and Criminality. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. 
But uh, with the creation of the, the modern schooling system and really the, the Prussian education system, which was adopted largely in the late 19th century, early 20th century in America and elsewhere around the world, as John Taylor Gatto and other researchers have, have detailed, you started to, to have the possibility of the curriculum uh, being being standardized in a way that would create a predictable outcome for uh, for students. And that predictable outcome isn't really difficult to understand what it was or why it would be desired by people in, in industries of various sorts. Basically, they wanted not independent thinkers who were capable of uh, thinking and acting for themselves, but really people who were educated enough to understand what was needed of them. But basically to consign themselves to a, a life of labor in a factory, which, of course, was the predominant industrial system of the time. And uh, we don't have to speculate about this. Uh, we have this on the record from, for example, Frederick Taylor Gates, who was appointed by Rockefeller to lead uh, the John D. Rockefeller-created uh, General Education Board, which was uh, Rockefeller's first major act of philanthropy endowed with $180 million in 1902, a staggering sum of money at that time. And in a tract written in the early 1900s, Frederick Taylor Gates wrote that uh, he said, in our dream, we have limitless resources and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. The present educational conventions fade from our minds and unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill upon a grateful and responsive folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or science. We are not to raise up from among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists, painters, musicians, nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. Uh, ultimately, of course, what are they trying to raise up then? Uh, it is docile workers for the factories of, of these industrial monopolists. And uh, they were remarkably successful, I think, in that endeavor if you start to look at the uh, educational outcomes of the, uh, the, the rest of the century. But it's not only Rockefeller, but uh, Rockefeller and the Carnegie Endowment worked together in the early part of the 20th century to shape the historical understanding, first in American history, and then through a number of scholarships and uh, the creation of various educational institutions and uh, and societies, really started to shape the the way that history and uh, education was taught in the United States generally. And another aspect of that was, of course, the Flexner Report, which was released in uh, 1910. That was an overview of the American medical education system at that time that brought about a revolution in the American medical system, which was the next sort of phase of scope of what the, the oligarchs were looking to try to transform. Well, that's right. Could you explain the petrochemical interests behind modern medicine? How does modern medicine differ from medicine in the past, and what does it have to do with petrochemicals? Well, there are are uh, uh, different paradigms for understanding uh, what medicine is or how it functions. And in the late 19th century, the battle lines, or if not battle lines, at least the, the demarcation lines had been drawn between homeopathy, naturopathy, which looked at natural herbs and, and other uh, ways of trying to uh, stimulate the, one's own immune response, versus the uh, allopathy, uh, which of course is trying to cut and burn or try to get rid of diseases in various ways. And in the late 19th century, there was, there was an old phrase that basically one way you'll die of the cure, the other way you'll die of the disease, uh, talking about the pretty poor results of, uh, of medicine at that time. Uh, basically, the, some of the grotesque types of uh, surgeries that were done without uh, anesthesia or other types of uh, ways of relieving pain were excruciating and uh, caused a lot of uh, early deaths themselves. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of naturopaths and homeopaths didn't really have uh, ways of, of dealing with a lot of illnesses. So there was this sort of uneasy tension and there was really no regulation um, by the, the end of the late 19th century in terms of the, the medical industry. There was no formalized, uh, standardized system for education, let alone the uh, American Medical Association was only just being birthed. So 
there was a there was a very scattershot approach to medicine uh, in the early days, but uh, that of course was overtaken by the creation of the American Medical Association and the the Flexner report, which, as I say, had a huge impact. It was a, a Carnegie sponsored uh, report by someone who went on to work for the Rockefeller Institute. Uh, looking at the the American medical education system and how it was sloppy and how it should be standardized. And of course, one of the ways that it ultimately became standardized was to to make it a rigorous uh, seven-year training process or or more in, in which uh, doctors were were trained in the use of of medicines, which conveniently enough for the oligarchs tended to be petrochemically derived medicines. And one, I think, particularly interesting example of that, uh, which I point out in the documentary, is New Joel, which is short for New Oil, which was the name of what was marketed as a laxative. It was literally just a crude oil uh, byproduct that was marketed by a standard oil subsidiary uh, that also produced pesticides at the same location, the same factory, incidentally, that was marketed um, as, as, as a laxative that would cost something like 10 to 29 cents for a six ounce bottle. It cost uh, a standard oil less than half a cent to actually create that bottle, but uh, led to quite a lot of profit, obviously. Those are the types of uh, direct monetary interests that uh, the petrochemical uh, manufacturers had in the creation of our modern conception of medicine to the point where today medicine is synonymous with, of course, the, uh, the, the idea of going to a doctor and getting a prescription for a, a medicine, usually, again, a petrochemically derived medicine as a way of trying to uh, cope with illness rather than, of course, looking at ways to improve one's own immune system or to uh, basically deal with the uh, prevention side of medical care rather than the cure side. What are some of the corporations involved in modern medicine, and how did they affect their control? Well, some of the largest uh, chemical companies in the world uh, were, for example, BASF, uh, which derives from a company that was founded in Germany in the early 20th century called IG Farben. And it was a drug and chemical cartel that was founded by some of the largest chemical companies in Germany at that time. And it became one of the largest uh, industrial manufacturers in the world, in fact, only behind uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey and a few other companies uh, to take the, the largest company spot. And after World War II, uh, IG Farben was disbanded because of its help in the rise of the Third Reich. But uh, exactly like Standard Oil, which was broken up in uh, the early part of the 20th century, but in fact just became a even larger corporation, really, or a series of corporations when it was disbanded, uh, IG Farben was likewise. So BASF, of course, remains one of the largest chemical companies in the world today, as are a couple of other offshoots that I think will be well known to the audience, Bayer and Sanofi, which are some of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And uh, again, this ties directly back to the oligarchical influence uh, that, that we've seen uh, with IG Farben having been not only itself a, a petrochemical and, uh, a company, but also one that, that had on its, its board Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who I mentioned before was part of the Royal Dutch Shell uh, conglomerate. So again, this t traces back back to the same families that have been together with this petrochemical interest since the beginning. And uh, to this day, I mean, Bayer and Sanofi remain some of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies in the world and extremely uh, profitable companies for those involved with them. Let's talk about food. What is the green revolution and does it differ from the gene revolution? Uh, well, yes, in a, at least in a manner of speaking. The Green Revolution uh, dates back to the 1940s, and it dates back to, in most readings of history, it dates back to Norman Borlaug, who was a researcher who was investigating various uh, forms of wheat and maize and other crops that were being cultivated in Mexico. And his task was to try to find uh, crops that would be more resistant to various uh, problems that's, that Mexican farmers would have. And part of his research uh, involved finding new strains, creating new strains of, of wheat and uh, other crops that would be more responsive to the Mexican farmers and their plights. Uh, and he was quite successful in that. And through a, a variety of uh, techniques, he was able to breed new strains of, uh, of wheat, for example, that were much more resilient and provided a lot greater 
um, crops yield. And as a result of that and the application of his various techniques in various places around the world, we had what is called the Green Revolution, basically an enormous increase in yields that took place throughout the 1950s and 60s and 70s uh, that was enabled by this, this revolution through these modified strains, but also through the introduction of modern industrial farming techniques. And of course, as it turns out, Norman Borlaug was a researcher for the Rockefeller Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation and associated interests in a number of petrochemical and associated companies started to uh, fund to the tune of billions of dollars the cultivation of these crops in various third world countries. Uh, and of course, also attendant with it, the creation of the modern agribusiness cartels, uh, including the ABCD seed cartel, the Archer Daniel Midland, uh, Bunge, Cargill, Louis Dreyfus. Some of these companies uh, really started to, to consolidate control over world food supplies at that time and uh, continue to uh, in, the, in the present day. And of course, this was, again, directly uh, beneficial to the oligarchs themselves, who, of course, as one of their, their petrochemical derivatives is uh, petrochemically derived fertilizers. So you had uh, uh, fertilizer companies like uh, DuPont and Hercules Powder and others that were able to directly benefit from this. But then, of course, there was also the secondary or uh, tertiary benefits of this that also accrued to the oligarchs in the form of the modern industrial practices that were being spread around the world at the same time as this Green Revolution with fertilizers and tractors and irrigation. Of course, all of these modern farm implements running on oil and uh, oils uh, supplied uh, energy from, of course, the oligarchs themselves. And a lot of this was financed uh, through the U.S. government, through U.S. aid programs, including President Johnson's Food for Peace program. So basically, the agribusiness giants were making direct profits from this Green Revolution via the U.S. government and ultimately the U.S. taxpayers uh, and in, in the service of this, this spreading of, of the Green Revolution around the globe. And the Green Revolution has been sold as this great success story, but there are, of course, numerous downsides that have taken place as a result of it as well. First of all, it's not at all clear that the uh, enormous increases in yields that we saw in the middle of the 20th century were directly related to the Green Revolution itself. In fact, in India, uh, research has shown that the pace of the crop yield increases actually started to slow after the introduction of the Green Revolution because of disparate ways that this was being applied in different areas. And it also had real social costs in a lot of places. Uh, basically, this tended to uh, benefit people who were uh, rich landowners already uh, at the expense of the farm working peasants who were more and more being replaced basically by automation and had to uh, move to urban slums and try to find ways of, uh, of making money, usually by ending up in third... Uh, third world condition sweatshop like condition uh, factories producing uh, goods for for multinational conglomerates so there was a lot of downside to the green revolution but it's usually uh, talked about as some sort of great success i'm speaking with writer and producer james corbett today's show oil and 911 crossroads of corruption and criminality i'm bonnie faulkner this is guns and butter the Green Revolution ultimately, of course, just parlayed into the Gene Revolution, which is what is the, the moniker for the modern, what they call the biotech tech industry uh, revolution of the food supply, which is now looking at various ways to scientifically engineer at the genetic level various strains of different crops that will be even more resistant and supposedly require less uh, fertilizers and other chemical inputs. Although actually research shows that uh, genetically modified crops actually require more uh, fertilizers than than did their non-genetically modified brethren. So it, uh, again, is uh, a revolution that may, may be more hype than it is actually delivering. But at any rate, it is, of course, once again, populated by the same petrochemical interests. You have all of the IG Farben offshoots uh, with their own biotech 
branches. You have Bayer crop science, you have BASF plant science, you have Dow agroscience, you have DuPont biotechnology and a lot of other related firms uh, with oligarchical interests. But on top of that, you have a dizzying array of different research institutes and societies that have been created directly through Rockefeller or Rockefeller associated uh, money uh, in the past few decades to try to spread this gene revolution. There's the uh, the International Rice Research Institute, which of course is Rockefeller funded. You have the International Service for the Acquisition of Agrobiotech Applications, uh, which is a Rockefeller slash Monsanto slash U.S. aid uh, conglomerate. Uh, you have the Consultative Group of International Agriculture Research, which was created by the World Bank in association with the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations. So a lot of these, these same monies are, are, are accruing to this uh, gene revolution, which is really just the furtherance of the green revolution. And in many ways, represents a really worrying monopolization of the building blocks of life itself when you start looking at the ways that uh, the gene revolution relies on these genetically modified crops which are patented and patentable and these companies are not afraid to use them uh, in fact they they already have in numerous uh, locations uh, used the the philanthropic cover to introduce these genetically modified strains in the midst of uh, severe droughts and other uh, problems with with harvests, and then actually gone and tried to sue farmers or entire countries, in fact, that uh, that were trying to use these these products, these genetically modified uh, products, without paying the proper royalties. In fact, that's exactly what happened in Argentina, where Monsanto did exactly that and then and ended up trying to demand royalties from Argentina farmers for planting their, their crops. So this is again going on and it, it represents not only billions upon billions upon billions of dollars for the, the companies involved in these biotech uh, uh, conglomerates, but of course also, again, a worrying a consolidation of control of the seed supply itself in the hands of a very few companies. Well, that's right. In addition to that, of course, the very big questions about the health effects for people who eat these genetically modified foods, that's a whole other subject as well. As you point out, funding of the gene revolution is provided by the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and other such organizations. What is the ultimate goal of all of this control? Well, I, this is really, I think, the the important thing for people to grasp. Once again, I don't think that ultimately the the monetary incentive is the only one at work here. I think that's the easily understandable one. And of course, there are, as I say, there are numerous uh, corporations that are making billions upon billions of dollars through the spreading of this green slash gene revolution around the world. But I think it's at this point, when you look at some of the uh, the oligarchs themselves, I don't think money is necessarily the driving factor behind this. I think that we have to start to understand that this is ultimately about control, a control of society, control of the very genetic uh, code of the, the planet itself. And that might sound outlandish until you start to piece all of these different pieces of the puzzle together. Control over education, control over medicine, control over plants and uh, agriculture. Start to form a control grid which really does look like a monopolization of almost every aspect of life as we know it. And the question is, is there an ideology behind this, an ideology driving it? And the answer is a resounding yes. And in fact, that is exactly what I'm going to get into in the follow-up to this documentary, which I hope to have released in the next month or two, which will be looking at the ideology of control that is really driving the oligarchs. And it has its roots in late 19th century development of the pseudoscience, the now discredited pseudoscience of eugenics, that was largely funded and helped by, of course, the Rockefellers in the American context through American research centers like the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and the American Eugenics Society and around the world, including, of course, in Germany through the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and how that eugenics uh, idea, which is basically the idea that there are certain uh, people who are just genetically superior to others and thus have a sort of modern scientific divine right to rule. 
Uh, it's the modern scientific gloss on that. And uh, that ultimately was uh, parlayed into a type of crypto eugenics after World War II and the discrediting of eugenics as pseudoscience, uh, which took on the form of overpopulation fear mongering and uh, has really taken on the, uh, the, the form of the guise of uh, concern about climate. And I think that's going to be the next way in which this agenda of control is being foisted on the public. Well, as you say in your part four, conclusion, monopolizing life, you say that the aim was much greater than a mere oil monopoly. It was the quest to monopolize all aspects of life. And I think you've uh, just laid that out pretty clearly. I'm very much looking forward to the second installment of these documentaries. I'll have to hand it to you for putting these things together. This must uh, entail an awful lot of work on your part. It is an incredible amount of work. I guess I have the advantage that I've now been researching these subjects for the last 10 years, and so I've accrued an awful lot of information. The real hardest part part of it is trying to distill it down to an hour and 15 minutes and have it make sense. Uh, I think you'll find in my podcast archives, I've talked about a lot of these subjects before, maybe not some of these details, but these subjects, broadly speaking, I've talked about at great length in many, many different hours of many different podcasts, but trying to distill it down is the hardest part. So really, the the writing of this uh, this transcript took about a month, a month and a half to put together. And of course, there was a, about a month of video editing uh, that my video editor did an excellent job of putting this together. But really, it does represent the culmination of, of upwards of a decade of research. Well, I'm not surprised to hear that. And of course, when I was watching your hour and 15 minute documentary, whoa, I had to keep stopping and, and thinking because it goes by very quickly. And as I said before, it and you've reiterated, it covers a vast amount of subjects, very complex James, I'd like to now talk about another documentary that you made on 9-11. In your documentary, 9-11 Trillions, Follow the Money, an investigation of the 9-11 money trail, you begin with the question, what was 9-11? A terrorist atrocity? An attack on America? The first salvo in a new war? A day that changed everything? Well, that's a very good question. What was 9-11 in your opinion? I think first and foremost, we have to understand 9-11 as a crime. And I don't think this is just a matter of semantics. I think it's extremely important the way that we approach uh, 9-11, what it was, uh, in order to determine how we should approach understanding it, trying to piece it together and, and understand what happened. If we take it as an act of war, a terrorist atrocity, if we just immediately start to to do that, we put it into a framework where we have already assumed the conclusion. We know who is behind it, we know what it was done for, and we know how to respond. And that's, of course, exactly what took place. And we saw the, uh, well, we're still living through all of the various ramifications of that, including not only, of course, the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, still ongoing to this day, but of course, ultimately the invasion of Iraq, which was largely predicated on the fear that was induced on 9-11. And we are still obviously with ISIS living through the ramifications of that. So I think it's extremely important to understand that 9-11 essentially was a crime. It was a crime perpetrated by uh, well, there have been the, the people identified by the 9-11 Commission as the 19 hijackers. But uh, but more importantly, crimes do not take place, generally speaking, or certainly not crimes of this magnitude, just by a few individuals just deciding to get on a plane one day. There is a conspiracy behind them, necessarily, by definition. If they have conspired to bring this about, there is a conspiracy. So I think we have to try to understand that. And of course, when we look at it as a crime, one of the key investigative tools for any uh, would-be investigator of any crime is follow the money. This is a dictum that is well known because it does tend to work. We, we can understand the connections. We can start to piece together how the crime was committed and why it was committed if we start to look at the various ways uh, that, that it was funded and, and the, the, the ramifications of this, what kind of monetary effects did this have? And I think when we put 9-11 in that context, we have a vastly different story going on than what we've been presented with in the news media as the official story of 9-11. You begin your documentary on 9-11 with the heist. 
You state that in 1998, the New York, New Jersey Port Authority decided to privatize the World Trade Center complex and that in April of 2001, an agreement was reached with a consortium of investors led by Silverstein Properties and that in July of 2001, a 99-year lease was signed with Larry Silverstein. How was this deal unusual? Well, there were a few things that were unusual about it, one of which was that the Port Authority had only insured the WTC Centre for $1.5 billion. And in fact, earlier, uh, I believe earlier in 2001, it, the entire complex had been estimated at a value of $1.2 billion. And yet Silverstein insisted on insuring uh, $3.55 billion, which is a doubling of the amount of insurance that the Port Authority had on it, which again is somewhat unusual. And in fact, was such a large deal that it was uh, very difficult to put together. Uh, Silverstein's insurance broker ultimately had to split the coverage up uh, amongst uh, 25 different dealers. It was a very complex negotiation that was still ongoing as September 11th unfolded. Uh, there was preliminary agreements in place, but it had not all been finalized, which led to the years and years of court battles that we saw in the years afterwards with Silverstein uh, being embroiled in, in all sorts of court actions uh, against his insurers, trying to claim not only, of course, the $3.55 billion that the, the, the World Trade Center had been insured for under that deal, but in fact, $7.1 billion, because as he immediately in the wake of 9-11 uh, tried to, to claim, this was not one, but two acts of terrorism, and thus counted double for the insurance purposes. So that was uh, uh, fairly unusual. Also, uh, just the fact that this was a 99-year uh, a lease that specifically included provisions in the event of the destruction of the towers that would uh, allow Silverstein properties to rebuild on in that area and to uh, increase the amount of commercial space available in that area, which is interesting because, of course, prior to 9-11, the World Trade Center uh, was not a prime real estate property. It was not fully leased. It was, uh, in fact, an aging building that uh, had many problems or aging buildings that had many problems with them, including asbestos problems that were going to require a large amount of money to, to solve. And in fact, they were they were not a, a particularly, other than the prestige associated, of course, with uh, being the leaseholder of the, the World Trade Center, there were a lot of uh, uh, problems with, uh, with the buildings themselves. Well, that seemed to have been taken care of, I suppose, in just literally weeks after the ink was dry on that deal. I'm speaking with writer and producer James Corbett. Today's show, Oil and 9-11, Crossroads of Corruption and Criminality. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. Is it also true that Larry Silverstein took out insurance against a terrorist attack? Uh, terrorist events were part of the coverage. Uh, I, my understanding is that that was not in and of itself unusual. Uh, of course, his uh, uh, trying to to make the uh, the two plane strikes count for two different terror attacks was was somewhat uh, uh, beyond the pale. But he ultimately did end up um, making over $4 billion in insurance coverage, and he had only insured for $3.55 billion. So the courts ultimately handed him uh, something of a victory in that regard. And ultimately, he did profit from the attacks directly. You say that a much deeper, more complex, and well-hidden heist was taking place behind closed doors on September 11th, 2001. What can you tell us about this deeper heist? First of all, what is Marsh and McLennan? Marsh and McLennan builds itself as a diversified risk insurance and professional services firm, ultimately a type of insurance uh, agent that currently has over 57,000 employees and, uh, and brings in revenues of over $13 billion every year. Uh, at the time of 9-11, they occupied floors 93 to 100 in the North Tower of the World Trade Center, and uh, they had uh, hundreds of employees working there. And this is important because Marsh had recently, uh, just prior to the attacks, contracted with a firm called Silverstream Software to try to create 
an electronic connection between Marsh and some of its premier clients for paperless transactions. Nothing of this sort had been uh, accomplished or, or even attempted before this point, and so they were really trying to pioneer something with this. So some of their largest clients included Merrill Lynch and Deutsche Bank and Bankers Trust and Alex Brown, Morgan Stanley, and other financial services firms that were uh, uh, contracting with Marsh. And so they were creating this special proprietary uh, electronic uh, paperless transactions uh, software system. And in fact, they ultimately ended up uh, winning a type of industry, uh, insurance industry insider kind of award called the Accord Award, I believe in 2001, um, specifically for developing that system uh, shortly before the, the 9-11 attacks. And this software, uh, the the extent of it is uh, is not really publicly uh, known, but we do have one person who is working on that deal as a, as a sales representative for Silverstream who has come out uh, and talked about the deal itself. And his name is Richard Grove. Uh, he now has his own podcast and uh, runs his own website at tragedyandhope.com. But he was part of this, uh, this deal as a sales representative who started to notice anomalies in the, the way that this contract was being billed. And basically, to the tune of millions of dollars, money was being put into this uh, this deal that that wasn't making its way uh, uh, through the system properly. And he was he was trying to to sort this out with various people, both at Silverstream and at Marsh and at Marsh's clients. And this started to become a, a major issue. And ultimately, on 9-11 itself, there was a meeting that was taking place uh, that we do have independent confirmation that this uh, this took place from Marsh's uh, chief information officer, Ellen Clark, in a 2006 interview. There was a meeting that was taking place in Marsh's offices in the World Trade Center on 9-11 uh, that was uh, specifically going to hear about uh, these these suspicious parts of this this uh, contract that was that was taking place now uh, obviously in the north tower on 9 11 uh where this conference call was taking place none of the employees involved in that uh, conference call survived richard grove who was stuck in traffic on the way to the world trade center uh, as he was supposed to to make an appearance at that uh, conference call ultimately didn't make it there and uh, survived to to tell the tale now, the interesting part of this comes uh, in the wake of 9-11 when there was a, a German company called Convar Infosys that was hired to try to recover some of the information from the hard drives at the World Trade Center. And there was uh, quite a bit of coverage about this in December of 2001, there, including a Reuters article and uh, uh, Fox News, I believe, covered at CNN talking about the the investigation that Convar was involved in and trying to recover this information from the damaged hard drives. And as a representative of Convar at that time, uh, Peter Herschel talked about, they started to find a large number of anomalous and unexplained transactions in the immediate lead up to and during the attacks themselves on 9-11. And he, uh, Peter Herschel, the Convar's director, said, the suspicion is that inside information about the attack was used to send financial transaction commands and authorizations in the belief that amid all the chaos, the criminals would have, at the very least, a good head start. And this is interesting because we also have uh, from Michael Rupert, who I believe you've, you've talked to in the past, uh, one of the former Deutsche Bank uh, employees who was working in the World Trade Center at that time talked to him about uh, how the, the computer systems in Deutsche Bank in the Twin Towers were being, quote unquote, taken over, co-opted and run by something. They didn't know where it was coming from. There was a massive data purge, a massive data download as the attacks were happening. And, uh, of course, all of this swirls around the e-link clients that, uh, that Silverstream software was, was developing with uh, uh, Marsh for its, its uh, key uh, contractors. So all of this seems to indicate, and again, Convar did start to find hard data backing up the fact that there were anomalous transactions taking place in the World Trade Center at the time of 9-11, but interestingly enough, that Convar uh, in investigation was ultimately quashed and the FBI 
will no longer talk about it. Convar itself will no longer talk about it. They will not even confirm that they ever did this work, although they do talk about it in promotional materials. When asked by interviewers about the information, what they found, what kind of transactions they were looking at, how much, uh, they will now not, not talk about it at all, uh, simply saying that that investigation was over and they're, they're not allowed to talk about it anymore. Uh, we do know that the FBI was one of the, uh, the uh, investigative agencies that was getting information from this, but they have not released any reports on what was found in the Convar uh, information. So we know that there was anomalous transactions taking place. We know that there was this unusual, unprecedented e-link that was being uh, forged in the, the months prior to 9-11 between Marsh and McLennan and its various uh, uh, contractors. And we have uh, testimony from a Deutsche Bank employee that there was something very anomalous happening during the attacks themselves. But we don't really have ultimately any answer as to what this all was, because unfortunately, again, all of these investigations have uh, have been quashed and come to an end. Now, did did Richard Grove work for Silverstream or for Marsh? He was working for Silverstream Software specifically as a sales uh, a representative. He was selling the software um, that S Silverstream was developing to Marsh so that Marsh could develop this e-link uh, software. I see. And yes, you uh, you mentioned Michael Rupert. Just as an aside, um, the first program that I ever produced on Guns and Butter was actually a little half-hour program live with Mike Rupert uh, one month after 9-11. It was uh, going to be an economic show on the put options, and of course it turned into a show on 9-11. And so I've found this subject following me around uh, ever since. What did you discover in your research about insider trading in the days leading up to and on September 11th? Well, as you say, Michael Rupert did do pioneering work on this issue, and it's one that's uh, somewhat understood by, I think, a lot of the public at this point, but really only in a, in a tiny little way. A lot of people have heard about the put options that were put on various airlines, uh, the American Airlines and, and United Airlines, that were, of course, obviously adversely affected by 9-11. Uh, and that is a, a part of the story. And it was one that was that was well covered in the first couple of months after 9-11, even in, in mainstream uh, locations, ABC News and others covered it, talking about some of these put options. And to put it into perspective, for example, uh, you have uh, put options on United Airlines that were put in the days prior to 9-11 that were relatively small, $180,000, but in the wake of 9-11 and, of course, the plunging of United Airlines stocks, that turns into $2.4 million. So millions of dollars of benefits. And that's just one example of one of the trades that was made. And I think the impression that a lot of people have is that, well, this was investigated and they found that there was really nothing behind it and it's been overhyped. Quite the contrary. In fact, there have been three different scientific studies that have taken place over the past uh, 10 years that have demonstrated that there is a statistically identifiable increase in put option activity, unusual increase in option activity in uh, the S&P and Dow Jones in the way in lead up to 9-11 that are suggestive of advanced knowledge of the attacks. And it isn't just airlines. Uh, there was a number of put options on a number of companies that were uh, directly impacted by 9-11, including uh, Boeing, Merrill Lynch, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Munich Re, the AXA Group, uh, Martian McLennan was one of the major uh, companies that were that were uh, implicated in this options trading. But also uh, on the other side, not just put options, but call options, i.e. basically bets that the stock was going to increase, were also put in an anomalous uh, way on Raytheon stock, which at the time was uh, $25.00. Of course, after the invasion of Afghanistan, which was uh, heavily uh, supplied by Raytheon Tomahawk missiles, uh, that stock went up to $34, a 37% increase. So again, there was a lot of different trades made on a lot of different stocks in the immediate run-up to 9-11. We're talking days and weeks prior to 9-11 that ultimately ended up paying uh, millions and millions of dollars. 
Uh, the official investigation of this by the FBI ultimately concluded that we have not developed any evidence suggesting that those who had advanced knowledge of the September 11th attacks traded on the basis of that information, which seems to be, at first glance, a denial that there had been any advanced trading taking place. But in fact, when you look at that, they say that there is no evidence suggesting that those who had advanced knowledge traded on the basis of that information, which of course begs the question, how did the FBI, how did the Department of the Treasury, how did the SEC determine who had advanced knowledge of the attacks, especially when when there seems to be advanced knowledge in the, the very act of placing these bets themselves? And that uh, question is begged even more when you look at some of the leads that were deliberately not followed up uh, by the FBI. For example, a briefing document from the FBI uh, in 2003 that was declassified in 2009 identified uh, a couple of individuals who, for example, had purchased 56,000 shares of Stratisec uh, stock in the days prior to 9-11, stock that did go up. Uh, they, they provide security systems to airports, which of course saw an increase in, in revenues uh, in the wake of 9-11 and the increased security procedures that were implemented. Incidentally, they were also in charge of uh, uh, security at Dulles and uh, the World Trade Center and United Airlines. So they were also implicated in the quote-unquote failure of 9-11, but uh, their stock did go up. So this purchase of 56,000 shares in the days prior to 9-11 was of interest, but the FBI decided not to even interview the, the people who had bought these stocks because the investigation found that they revealed no ties to terrorism or other negative information. And Kevin Ryan, who I believe you've also interviewed on this program, has talked uh, about how that was uh, ultimately it was Wirt Dexter Walker III, a distant relative of George W. Bush, uh, President Bush, but also a business partner of Marvin Bush, the president's brother. So these were a couple of the uh, the people who were identified in that FBI investigation and not even interviewed because they had no conceivable ties to terrorism. Therefore, they could not have been trading on advanced knowledge. So I think that goes to show that the FBI investigation was was ultimately an open question itself. How did they know that these people had no advanced knowledge? Visit gunsandbutter.org to hear the remainder of this interview and read a transcript. James Corbett, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure.